Okay, so I guess we should start. Um, so welcome back to Zoom break. Hope you had a nice break. Um, the couple of announcements are the, the, the midterm solutions. I'll post them today online. As uh, I will the notes for this whole week, so you can look, print them out and bring them to class as well. I forgot to do it last night. Uh, also, the next problem set, the, the fourth problem set is due on Thursday. And the uh, problem set five will be posted on Thursday as well. Okay, so the main things. And I think you will get your graded uh, midterms back. I think today or tomorrow. Just check the, the homework folder. Okay, okay. So we have a lot to cover this week. Actually, we need to try to finish chapter uh, five. Okay, it's a lot of material. So let's get started. So to review, uh, <clears throat> we should be very comfortable after the midterms and after all the problem sets for calculating current voltage characteristics of equilibrium conditions. <coughs> when no voltage is applied, you know, what happens? When a bias is applied, what happens? When a forward bias is applied, what happens? When a reverse bias is applied, what happens? So far, we should be very comfortable with that. The next step, of course, is to look at what happens in some detail as the transition happens between, let's say, forward bias and reverse bias, okay? And this, of course, is related to capacitance. So if you think about your old circuits class, you had, uh, you know, RLC circuits and so on, and you switched an AC uh, current through it, and you saw how the, the capacitor got charged and discharged and so on, you, you have a certain capacitance. The exact same thing happens for a PN junction. And the goal for us is to understand the physics of what happens and to model what happens, because this turns out to be very important. Again, if you think about it, this is the key limiting factor for switching of transistors. So how fast your computers are, things like that. Uh, probably also more importantly for cell phones and so on, how fast those circuits are also um, for um, receiving um, radio uh, signals and things, and processing radio signals and things like that. So very quickly, I know we saw this briefly, but this is important for what we're going to talk about later on, is that what happens under um, when you switch a diode from forward bias to reverse bias, what happens to the stored charge, okay? So the variation of, when we have forward bias, okay, we have steady state carrier injection. So we have carriers that are injected from the majority side. The majority carriers are injected from one side, to the other side, and they become minority carriers, and then they diffuse and recombine. Okay, that's the picture we have so far, which is shown here. So in this example, you have a P N plus junction because the N side depletion region is a little bit smaller. The electrons on this side will get injected across the junction, and they will diffuse and recombine. And we have a steady state at a fixed voltage, a steady state um, electron distribution in space. Okay. And this distribution comes about, if you recall, by solving the time-dependent diffusion equation. Okay, we, we, with this approximately and so on. Okay, and we have an exponential decrease, and which depends on what's called the diffusion length. Of course, diffusion length is a length, average length that the car minority carriers travel, okay, uh, before they recombine on an average. So we have millions and millions of electrons in the p-type, as what is the average distance each electron travels. So that sort of makes sense because that's the half length of uh, diffusion, essentially, if you think about it. Okay? Uh, exact same thing happens on the other side. Holes are injected on this side, and then they diffuse. Uh, same kind of representation now that you have uh, diffusion length for holes. Okay? Um, far away from the junctions, we know that they will disappear. If it's a long, long PN junction diode, they will all recombine and disappear. Right? There should be no diffusion current far away. Remember we talked about it, only drift. Remember, we had a plot of current, how the current is divided across the, across the PN junction. We have drift and diffusion of electrons and holes. Far away from the junction, there's only drift. There's no diffusion. Okay, they will all disappear. Okay, so how do we describe this? Uh, so, so first of all, before we do that, so this is under forward bias. So quickly, what happens if you reverse bias it? All these charges, of course, have to redistribute, right? Imagine if you, <clears throat> this is, is a positive terminal here, which is pulling all these electrons out. Okay, if you suddenly switch that um, sign, uh, if you suddenly switch that sign, of course the electrons will have to go in the opposite direction. 
right? But we know that the electrons cannot move instantaneously. First of all, they have to move, right? So they have to diffuse. There's some physical time that it takes. Second of all, they need to recombine. That also takes a physical time. In other words, the forward bias situation, the reverse bias situation are considerably different, if you remember. Okay, we'll look at the reverse bias in a second. Going from forward bias to reverse bias takes some time because the charges have to redistribute themselves. And that time lag between the applied voltage, sorry, uh, the applied voltage and the current is what we can think of as capacitance. This time lag that is required for the, the charges to be redistributed. Okay? And that, in a way, is what limits the speed of your uh, diode, for instance, or the speed of your transistor, uh, eventually, as we will talk about later. So keep that picture in mind. Okay, so with that, <coughs> uh, I won't go through this so carefully, but this is the time-dependent uh, uh, continuity equations for current, and we solve this to calculate the current density. Okay, so very quickly, basically, we have the how the current carrier concentrations uh, in space and time change. Uh, there is a there is an injection current, and then there is recombination happening. So two terms, and we can solve this in both time and space. The injection current, of course, is space dependent, as you can see, as a space derivative. But also, remember from our plots before, it is space dependent. The, the recombination is primarily time dependent, but you also have a space component here, because we know that's exponentially dependent on space, the numerator is. Okay? So anyway, it's a space and time uh, uh, dependence uh, uh, differential equation. You apply boundary conditions in solve, which is basically what we've done here. So you can uh, calculate the difference between the current par at zero minus the current at some distance x is just that integral. Okay, and we saw this before, so I'm going to go through it fairly fast. And we can further uh, assume that if the junction is, if if you're far away from the junction, like I said, there's no diffusion current, so you can set that to zero, because right now we're only talking about the diffusion current. Um, then, um, then, then with that boundary condition, we can. Uh, go ahead and solve it, and we, we essentially get two terms. So the physics is more important than the math, math you can solve, so I won't dwell on it today. Now, the physics is important because this is what happens in, in, in instantaneously. So remember, early on, we did essentially averaged over time. Right? We had voltage, we had current, and we had this nice plot of time. Okay? This is what happens at the small scale, infinitesimal time, as it switches. Okay? So the physics of that is relatively simple. You have two terms here. You have a charge redistribution term. Okay, that's essentially the total charge that's on one side of the junction. In this case, the holes on the end side, divided by the recombination uh, time, or the lifetime of the holes. Okay. So another way to think about it is that the, all the charge which is on this side, all this charge, which is that delta QP that we saw, has to be it disappears every tau p seconds. They recombine. Okay, that's the definition of tau p on an average, which means that, that those disappeared charges have to be replenished by something, and that something is carrier injection from this side, holes are injected from that side. Okay, so that's the first term. Okay, so, so be fairly clear about what that means. Then the second term is essentially the charge buildup or depletion term. So this is the term we had before. Okay, we saw that before. This is the transition term. So what happens as the charges are being built up, as the injection happens? So you have a rate of change of charge per unit time. Okay? Of course, at steady state, that's zero. So your fixed voltage, if you reached an equilibrium, that's zero. But if you change the voltage, there is this term that needs to be accounted for. So again, if you want to think about it, uh, think about it similar to the Similar to the, oh, is that, okay. oh, it's a um, to the current voltage curve that we saw before, the way to think about it is the following. It's, it'll get a little confusing soon. So you have that, we know where it was, right? Something like that. And here we know it has a saturation. Right? So what we are talking about is that if you have a fixed voltage, you have a fixed current. Right? That's steady state. Okay? So 
question we are talking about is what happens if you change the mode to suddenly to say V2? Does it need to go all the way to negative? What happens here? This change, for the, we know in steady state the current goes down there. So how does that change happen is what that discussed. Okay? So that transition, that's where the time dependence, that's primarily this term right here. Okay? Now, of course, this is a hard equation to solve. You have to solve it numerically with the boundary conditions. Okay, because the problem has to do with the fact that we don't exactly know what this one looks like, the total charge there, during the transition, because of the boundary condition of the junction, which we talked about last class. You can go back and look at it. So anyway, uh, oh, it's here also. So, so this is the simple example we looked at, where we had a current, you switched it off. Okay, so you had a current, and this example is very simple. So PN junction. You have a switch, you have a battery. The forward bias, okay, the switch open at t equals zero. So what happens? The charge, what happens to the charges? Clearly, it's fairly simple because if you think about it, this is the distribution of charges in the n side of the junction. As you turn off the current, what will happen? They have to disappear. There's no current, right? so they have to recombine, essentially. There's lots and lots of electrons here, so of course they will recombine really easily really fast, and they will decrease in time. So, so this is decreasing, sorry, this is what you sh I should have shown. So this plot is what we saw before, the charge distribution on the end side. As soon as you turn off the current, they start decreasing, right, because they recombine. But because of the boundary condition at the, at the uh, here, this slope has to go to zero because the diffusion current must be zero. Total current must be zero. There's no current, right, because you turned off the circuit. I mean, open the circuit. So it, what that means essentially is the slope of the carrier concentration at the junction is zero. We talked about this last time, so I won't dwell on it. But this, this part must be zero, which means that this expression is very difficult to actually analytically solve. But in any case, we can make some uh, approximations, assume that's exponential decay, which is so-called quasi-static approximation. And uh, we can solve it and get an exponential decay in the total charge. So in other words, the, the physics essentially says that it takes some time for the excess force to recombine. So as soon as the current has gone off, the voltage is not quite off yet. Okay? So if I had a fixed voltage here, and suddenly that voltage is turned off, the current takes some time, there is a lag. Sorry, when the current is turned off by opening the circuit, the voltage takes some time for it to go to zero. That's basically the, the conclusion, the physics I want you to take from it, okay? So that's the capacitance, right? Same, this is basically the same behavior as a capacitance, okay? And you can solve it and so on. So anyway, I, I won't go through that. So, uh, yeah, so this is basically what it's saying. Even though the current is turned off, the charge, and hence the potential persists across the junctions, you have a potential delay, essentially, okay? And you have a voltage that is time dependent, which is shown here. So. Just jumping to the solution answer, you have Vt is kT over Q, some logarithmic dependence on, uh, on the recombination time, lifetime, the diffusion um, length, and the carrier concentration, origi original carrier concentration, Pn, and so on, okay? which of course makes sense, and it's exponentially dependent on the recombination lifetime. So you expect the voltage to sort of uh, almost quasi-linearly decrease, actually, right? Because it's a logarithm of an exponent, roughly, okay? So, uh, of course, this is a problem for mo most applications because you want fast switching, you want instantaneous switching. So, you know, you try to minimize this. But there are some applications where you try to make use of this, but we'll talk about that later. But to minimize this, you can look at the terms here and see how you can make it faster. The obvious, the obvious thing is tau p. You want to make tau p as small as possible. The charges recombine as fast as possible. Right? That's pretty common sense. And to uh, increase your combination, there are lots of things you can do. You can introduce impurities into the junction or near the junction. So they will actually recombine and disappear. Okay? So, and there are a couple of other things which I, you will actually do. The narrow based diode, I think it's in either one of the review problems or the, in the problem sets. So you will actually look at that as well. So I won't dwell on here. Oops, okay, so that's probably the uh, last part of that. So let me skip to the next one. Hmm. 
me, sorry, it'll, it takes a minute to load. Okay, that's good. Oh, that's not right. This is week nine. Oh, no, that was my mistake. Okay. So next, uh, this is the part we, I think we stopped last time. Basically, what happens, so right, so right now what we did was we turned off the circuit. Okay. We, we had a current flowing and we just turned it off and saw what, hap what happens. Now we're going to do probably what's more important for an application, which is, for instance, rectifying. You have an AC current or, the, or AC voltage. The voltage is switching between positive and negative. Okay, so imagine this ID curve. You have some voltage V1 and some voltage minus V1. Okay, and it's switching. So that's AC current, which is coming from the generation, generator, say, the power generation. Now, what happens if you put that? You're going from forward bias to reverse bias, forward bias. Reverse. Clearly, it's a diode, so you expect rectification, right? In general, forward bias, you get lots of current. Forward bias, you get very little current. But of course, how the details of that rectification are very, very important if you're actually using this as a rectifier. How fast does it switch? What is the average power that is transferred from AC to DC, so on and so forth, which you might have learned in your circuits class. Okay, so this is quite important. And this is a very important application for PN junction diodes, especially for gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, for power electronics. These things, and also um, uh, silicon carbide based uh, diodes and so on. Very, very important for very high current, uh, high power uh, applications on, on uh, printed circuit boards, as well as integrated applications. We'll talk about very briefly later on. Okay, so, so that's the question of what's called reverse recovery transient, which means that you're going from forward bias to reverse bias to back to forward bias to reverse bias. What happens to the charges? So what does the current transient look like when the diode is switched from forward to reverse bias and back? Okay, what is the forward bias current here in this particular case? You have a, actually that's an exam, uh, exercise for you guys. So look at this circuit. Okay, just forget everything else, just look at this little circuit here. Okay, you have an E of T current applied, you have a load resistor R, and you have a P plus N junction. Okay, and you have a current flowing. So can you tell me what the I is? Uh, spend 10, 15 seconds, talk to your neighbors, discuss. From whatever you know so far, look at the circuit and tell me. You should, be, you should know it enough to tell me what it is. Forget the fact that E is a time-dependent voltage for now. Assume it's just a constant. So what is it? Yeah, you guys should discuss. Come on, if you... Uh, just say how you would solve it to your neighbor. It's fine if you don't exactly know. Okay? What do you... Do you what do you think? No, no, no. I, I should know your name, but... <laughs> no, no, what, what do you think the answer is? So think about this as a very simple circuit. You have a battery at E, you have a load resistor, and you have a diode. As far as we know, the diode is at some voltage, yeah, and there's some currents. It is I. Okay. So first, the way I would approach it, so, 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 so how, do you, how do you think we should approach it? Just applying Ohm's law, right, at the end of the day. Okay. So first, think about, if you have a current I, there is a drop in the resistor, right? What is it? Come on, what's the drop in the resistor? Yes, okay. So then what's the voltage across the diode? Yes, is that clear? So think think about it first. I didn't care what yeah, said. I'm going to say it again. No, 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 that's okay. So first of all, look, if there's a current flowing, 
There's a resistor R, there's a voltage drop, right? Ohm's law, I times R. Okay, that's simple. Okay, now if the voltage is dropped across the resistor, the remaining voltage has to come across the diode, right? There's only a diode and a resistor. So it's E minus I times R comes across the PN junction. Okay, so far? Which means that on this curve, let's say my V1 is E minus I times R. So, right? All I need to do is plug that in here, and I know my current. Because I know it's, I am treating it as an ideal diode. Of course, we will change that. But from whatever you know, you should be able to solve a question like that. It's common sense, pretty much. Okay? Of course, if you think about this, this is a complicated equation, right? Because you have I on this side, you have I next one on there, so it's not easy to solve, but you can, in principle, solve it. Is that clear to everyone? Because that's important. <laughs> that this should be relatively simple by now. Yes, Jim. I told you, ignore the time dependence of voltage. Imagine it's a fixed E. Okay, just some voltage apply. That's why I mentioned that. Now, the time dependence of, we'll talk about in a second. But, okay, is that okay with everyone? You okay with that? Okay. Okay, so now, of course, that we know. So what happens when the time, when the current voltage is being changed? That's the question, okay? Of course, we know that it's, it has to shift, the current has to shift, and we, we need to understand how it changes. Okay? So we look at an AC input which looks like this. So in this case, you have your voltage is switching between plus E, minus E, and switching at a time period of T. Yes? Um, so I can spend like the time at home going over this, but that seems like a complex way to find stuff, is that you'd have the I show up in the exponent? Yes, yes, yeah, that's what I said, yeah. You have to solve that equation. It's not impossible, but you can solve it. Okay. There's no other way, right? Think about it. There's no other way. You have to solve it. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't simpler than I thought. No, it's not. And that's also, be clear to everybody here, okay? Right? This equation is not straightforward because you have I on both sides, what is the next one, and so on. Not impossible. You can solve it in MATLAB. Not that bad, but just keep that in mind. Okay, so I have one more exercise very quickly. What is the instantaneous reverse bias current at t equals zero? Uh, there should be no zero there. So at t equals zero, you have a, a voltage of minus e. So you do the same exercise as we just talked about. Okay, so you have a so in this in, the, in this case the the car, the, the the, the polarity here is reverse, so current has to be flowing the opposite way, and the drop is still IR, and the remaining voltage has to come across the junction, but it's reverse bias, and you put a plug it into the equation, exact same thing. But now, of course, if it's an ideal diode, what's the answer? Well, yeah, but think about this. It's not a, I mean, even in an ideal diode, we still have this IR. So current is always I naught in an ideal diode under reverse bias because it's voltage independent, right? Remember, look at this equation. If V is large enough, that minus and large enough, this uh, term basically goes away. So the current is always just minus I naught. We look at the curve, right? <coughs> so you should have a good feeling for things like that, forward bias, reverse bias. I mean, these are fairly simple. Okay, you shouldn't have to think too much through it. Okay, anyway, go home and think about it. Make sure it's very, you're comfortable with, these, uh, with this logic, okay? Okay, so the, the goal here, you know, of course, in forward bias, if you think about it, you have a carrier injection and we have that distribution, exponential distribution on both sides, right? Electron, uh, electrons on this side, holes on this side, and when you switch them, so, I mean, switch the polarity, those charges have to, excuse me, have to uh, reorder uh, themselves, redistribute themselves, okay? Uh, needs to be discharged during reverse bias. Okay. So let's see how that happens. So we can plot the current. That's the simplest way to do it, first of all. So first, we have a current under forward bias. So 
Okay, first of all, we are looking at this as the applied voltage, okay? And then looking at the applied current. Uh, I mean, the, the flowing current, okay? The resulting current, let's say. So forward bias current, like I said, is just E over R. So I made a very simplification. So I, I simplified something here. There's a sleight of hand here to some extent, right? And the reason for that is under forward bias, the voltage drop across the PN junction is very small. Right? It's just the contact potential minus V, right? E naught minus V, the applied voltage. Which means that the drop across the PN junction is small. Right? Which means that if you go back to your circuit here, oops. If you go back to your circuit here, if the voltage drop across here is small, most of the vo applied voltage will drop across the current uh, resistor. That's what that means, right? So I can make an approximation under forward bias. We'll take away this approximation soon, but I want you to also know this. You can very simply calculate the current by just assuming under forward bias that the diode is, has very little voltage drop. All the voltage actually drops across the resistor, so then the current is just E over R. Okay? Which kind of negates what I said before that you actually have to solve this carefully. Okay. So in reality, of course, you have to solve this carefully, but if you make the assumption that the total drop across the diode is very small, it's very easy to calculate. And it turns out if you actually do this calculation, you'll get, end up with very similar answers, as long as it's forward bias. Okay, this comes back to your point. So make sure you're, uh, anyway, think about that also. It's a little bit of a subtle point. Okay, yes? Does it also depend on uh, the, the voltage of, of the supply? Like yeah, that's E, right? Voltage. That's E. Well, yeah, I'm just saying if it's a really small. Yes, yes, you're right, you're right. Yes, at the end of the day, we have, the assumption here we'll make is that this V is small, is what that basically is. Okay, but don't worry too much about it. I think, uh, go back and think about it. Don't, it's a little bit of a subtle point. On the negative side, the calculation is much easier because we know it's a reverse saturation current, right? And it is uh, minus IR. It's fixed. It's whatever that this, this I naught is, or minus I naught. The storage charge can change instantaneously. So the, the current here <coughs> is still the same instantaneously. Okay? In other words, the terminals are reversed, so the sign has changed. But at the, at the next instant from minus zero to plus zero, the current cannot change instantaneously. Okay? Because remember, we haven't turned off the circuit. We just switched the voltage here. So the, the circuit is still closed. Yes? So the direction of current for the negative IR is the same as positive IF? Yes. The That's why it's a negative sign. Yes. Okay. Because the voltage is shift turned. OK? Of course, if at eventually, so this is the part that we will calculate. But if you go far enough in time, if it's switched from forward bias to reverse bias and you wait long enough, we know what the current should be. Current should basically go to very small value, right? The reverse saturation current. We know that, that much we know. We know the instantaneous current and we know the very final current. We don't know what happens in between, okay? That's a key, that's a key question we want to answer. Okay, so, Essentially, the answer, as, I, as we will see, is, is that we will see that the current basically remains constant until the voltage drop across the diode goes to zero. In other words, remember we started off with some voltage here, which is forward bias, and the current has, we, we have reversed the applied voltage, right? So the circuit, we have resistance, and we reverse the applied voltage. The current in the junction did not change instantaneously. It's exact, exactly the same. And the voltage has to change, as we will see. And it will change by going down to essentially zero. Okay? And 
then it will go to the negative supply voltage. When it goes to zero is where the current basically starts. After it goes, after it goes negative is when the current starts going to the, the very small value. Okay, so we'll see this in a second, what that means. Okay. The, if you plot the voltage as a function of time, so the voltage initially across the junction is very small. It's the forward biased junction drop voltage, right? So imagine this, this circuit is a forward biased. The voltage across the junction is very small. And that's this value here, OK, this value right here. OK, instantaneously, you switch the total uh, battery. The voltage doesn't change instantaneously. The current doesn't change instantaneously either. Okay, this is a different situation than we've talked before. So the charges have to take time. The voltage remains approximately the same, and then slowly goes to zero. Until then, the current basically remains the same. And then the voltage goes and follows to the negative bias. Okay? And the current, of course, decreases in, in value to the negative reverse saturation current. So intuitively, we can feel that this is what should happen to some extent. And this lag here, this time lag here between when the current actually starts to change and the voltage changes is, has to do with the carrier redistribution. This is what's called the junction capacitance, as you will see. This is the time it takes for the charges to essentially redistribute. And we'll see how they redistribute in a second. Okay? And that time is called the ch uh, storage delay time. It, what, how long it takes for the charges to go from forward bias to reverse bias, essentially. Okay? <clears throat> so, of course, to look at this in detail, we have to look at the minority carrier distribution in real time how it changes instantaneously, okay? This is the same thing we did before, right? So let's start with T equals zero, which we are very familiar with. That's forward bias carrier distribution. So this is uh, holes in the end side of the junction as a function of space away from the junction. So zero is the, the boundary of the neutral region and the junction, okay? The depletion region and the, and the neutral region. So we have this exponential decay, okay? Under forward bias, we know this because this is the carrier injection, right? The forward bias. Holes are being injected from the P side to the N side. They're recombining and they're diffusing. Okay, so far so good. Okay, now as as the voltage goes to reverse bias, instantaneously the charges have to redistribute themselves such that this slope here goes to essentially goes to zero. Uh, actually, it has to go less than uh, it has to go greater than zero because the current has to go into the opposite direction with respect to the voltage, okay? Which is essentially this part, okay? The current instantaneously goes from plus F to minus F. But of course, the current by itself has, the, the, has not changed direction. It's the voltage that has changed direction. Okay, so the current itself is instantaneously the same. The direction with respect to the voltage has changed, okay? Which means that this slope essentially has to go to greater from minus. The slope here is minus, right? to the slope, this is positive, instantaneously. And that can be done because you have a redistribution of charges basically very, very close to the junction. So the excess holes close to this region recombine very, very quickly, instantaneously, essentially. And that's OK. That doesn't violate any law of physics. Okay? Because it's a very small number of charges. Now, as the time goes by, the charges, of course, start going down and down. Why? Because remember, in reverse bias, what happens? In fact, in fact that was one of your midterm questions, right? The last question, I think. Right? In the reverse bias, what happens? Instead of carrier injection, you have carrier extraction, right? These carriers basically get pulled back. No? Right? So the P injected holes in forward bias. In the reverse bias, those holes will essentially be sucked back. Why? Because there's a big, really nice field here, right? Which is pulling those back. Okay, which is enhanced by the reverse bias voltage. So, of course, we expect at the end of the day all the carriers to go to the other side, which is what we talked about in terms of carrier redistribution. So all the carriers are on this side first, and of course, at the end of the day, under reverse bias, we know that they should go down or should we all go on to the other side? They should be extracted away, which means that the 
extra carriers will become negative. So you've taken away those carriers. Okay. So this blue curve and this black curve we know. Right? The blue curve is forward bias, black curve is reverse bias. We've seen those two. We just don't know what happens in between. Okay. And what happens in between takes time because the carriers actually have to move. And the motion takes time. Okay, there's recombination happening and the, and the diffusion happening as well as drift happening. Okay. And <clears throat> the, of course, so one thing to keep in mind is that this time interval we are talking about in this plot here is much smaller than half the period of that switching. Which means that if that switching happens, so, no, okay, so let's switch back, go back to the plot for a second. This is an important point. Look here for a second, okay? This T determines how fast you can switch, right? Shorter the T, faster I'm switching. Higher the frequency. One over T is the frequency of that signal, right? So let's say I need to process radio signals for a cell phone or whatever. I'm coming at very high frequencies, gigahertz and so on. So this T will be very small. Okay. Now, if t, this t is so small that it is comparable to this time tau tsd, then I have a problem. Right? I will not have charge redistribution before the next signal comes in, and I will have interference between the two cycles. And my resulting signal will be distorted. So if you remember your antenna or microwave class, I'm not entirely certain which one it is, but in one of those classes, I'm sure you've done some signal process, digital signal processing, so you have some fast signal coming in, you process and send it out, okay? And if you don't want distortion, you have to make sure that this TSD is small compared to the frequency of the incoming signal. So it's extremely important from a circuit perspective to understand where that, how to, what that TSD depends on, which is basically what we're talking about here. That this is the time for those charges to redistribute themselves. Okay. So once it reaches this curve, of course, the junction voltage is now zero. Okay. That's the situation where you have, yeah, actually, sorry, it has to be, when, when this is pretty much flat, when you are here. Oops, sorry when you are here, okay? After that, you start extracting the voltage, uh, the charges to the other side. So if you think about this half of the transition, it is basically the positive half of this, where the charges are essentially being extracted until they disappear, and the remaining part of it, this part, is basically where the charges are essentially extracted out to the other side. So you go to negative excess charge carriers. Of course, the equivalent thing happens on the other side for the n-type as well. Okay. okay, so that's basically the physics of what happens. And the modeling is essentially the same as what we did for the previous example where we switched off the current. Okay. The end of the day with the quasi-static approximation. So I won't de derive it again. It's exactly the same thing. If you assume a quasi-static Remember, what, what is the quasi-static approximation? Essentially states that this uh, shape essentially remains exponential. That's basically it. And we ignore this little detail here at the edge. And if you do that, then you can solve it, and you get an equation which looks like that, where the carrier concentration is dependent exponentially on the, applied, on the uh, junction voltage. Okay? Once you have that, then you can solve everything else. So. Um, then you can solve this, for instance. This is the voltage. So out here, when the V goes to zero, delta Pn is what? From this equation. It's what? Yeah, you're right, but I can't hear. Yes. Right? What does that mean? Delta Pn is excess holes. Pn is original holes. So the current hole concentration is Pn plus delta Pn, so Pn minus Pn is zero. So 
when b equals zero, the charge, total charge, excess, total actual hole concentration close to the junction goes to zero. Okay, they have been extracted away or recombined. Both of them happen at the same time. And that's the situation right here. The stored charge, the stored charge is depleted here, essentially. Okay, you have lots of stored charge here. It gets depleted, 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 it goes to zero. And of course, it goes into the reverse because you're extracting it out. The delta Pn now becomes negative. Okay, which of course you can see from the equation here when V is negative, this whole thing becomes very negative, right? Smaller than Pn. So the, del the, the actual concentration becomes negative as well. Excess concentration becomes negative, not actual concentration. Sorry. Okay. As more voltage drops across the junction, the current decreases until it reaches the reverse saturation curve. So that's, again, these two ends of the curve up here and here we know very well, right? That whole bias reverse bias. What happens in between is now defined by this simple equation, which we had seen before. Okay? So now we have a way to plot current versus voltage instantaneously and calculate capacitance. What's capacitance, by the way? Does anyone remember? Yeah, you have. Uh, no, no, I mean general. I'm, I'm just saying, in general, what, what do you think of when you think of capacitance? What's a capa what does a capacitance mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an ability to store charge, store and discharge charge, right? The capacitance is a measure of how charge changes with voltage, mathematically, right? So, so as voltage changes, how does charge change? That's basically a, what capacitance means. Here specifically, of course, it has uh, something more uh, similar to what you mentioned. But in general, capacitance has to do with the ability to store charge and discharge. It's a, it's a energy storage. That's another way to think about it. OK, so we will come to that in a second. But first of all, we also need to understand what does the time depend on, which is what uh, he mentioned before, right? The TSD, which is, again, the switching time, which I, met, which I told you will affect the highest frequency of your input signal that you can um, reliably process in your, in your circuit. Okay? So, oops. So this TSD, the storage delay time, is the time to discharge all the junction charge. Now we know at this point the voltage goes to zero right here. And that's the time it requires for all the charges which are under the forward bias to basically go to zero, disappear. Okay. And if you look at the current voltage curve, which is interesting, it kind of looks like this, right? So you start here, high voltage, forward bias, high current. Very instantaneously, this voltage goes there, <coughs> right? Of course, current takes some time. Current is still there. So it takes some time. It goes down slowly, slowly, slowly. And of course, in this case, it goes up to reverse bias, okay? which is basically what we saw before. That time it takes, this delay between forward bias and reverse bias is TSD, and that I won't go through the derivation, it's in the text, uh, is related to, of course, the whole lifetime. Okay. In the case of a P plus N junction. And you have an equivalent term for the electrons as well, which we're ignoring here because we assume that the holes are much more prevalent. Okay. And it depends with what's called an inverse error function on the forward current divided by forward current plus reverse current. There's a square term there. Okay, don't, don't worry too much about this part because that's an approximation and it depends on the actual, actual uh, details of how you fabricate the diode. The important point I want you to remember is what he mentioned, is that the charge storage delay depends on the whole, the minority carrier lifetime, essentially. Okay, it can be the whole of the electrons. Okay, again, we come to the same conclusion as we did in our previous example. In order to make this fast, I need to reduce the whole lifetime or the minority carrier lifetime. Same conclusion. Okay, so I can introduce recombination uh, defects uh, and I can work with the short base diode, uh, narrow base diode and so on. 
There are lots of ways, the ways you can manipulate the device fabrication to make this very, very small. Okay. Again, this limits how fast the diode can be switched. So if you look now at the current voltage characteristics in time, okay, this is what you will look at in an oscilloscope or a digital analyzer or whatever, right? You get an input voltage. What is the output current? Okay, very simple, very simple exercise, right? So your voltage is switches that way. You have a current, of course, uh, to start off with a forward bias current. Quickly it goes reverse bias. But remember, the current is still the same, but with respect to the voltage, it is reversed because the current hasn't changed instantaneously. It takes some time for it to recover. Almost zero. Okay, it remains zero until it's forward biased again. And this switching is really fast. Now, why is that fast, by the way? I mean, we, we only talked about forward to reverse bias. Any thoughts on what happens reverse to forward? Well, why, why should it be faster? Why, why? Physically, think about what happens to the carriers. So under reverse bias, there's extraction, right? The carriers, what does extraction mean? You have, you've just increased the majority carriers, so you've extracted holes from the, extraction means that when there are holes here, you pull them out to this side, the majority carriers are. The same thing happens for electrons. Electrons are pulled on the side. Did you have a thought on this? I did, but I lost it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so, when you forward bias it, what matters is basically carrier injection, right? And that injection can happen very fast. Why? Because it's a majority carrier injection, first of all, there's lots of carriers. Second of all, it's drift initiated, right? The electric field will basically sweep it across. Of course, after that, then you have recombination and diffusion on the other side, but the injection itself can be very fast. So that's why this response here can go up quite fast. It's not instantaneous if you actually look at the details. But for all our purposes, we will treat this as instantaneous. So think about that as well. Yeah? Um, what happens if the switching time is uh, smaller than the transition? Yeah. Time? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, it's a very important point, which is what I mentioned before. So what she's asking is what happens if this period gets squeezed such that this becomes significant? Think about what happens. Okay. What, happens what do you think happens to the current? Okay, let's start with forward bias. That's easy. Uh, I have to think. Okay. Yeah. So let's imagine forward bias and suddenly on reverse bias. And you have this distortion happening. Before it has reached the reverse bias, you switch it again, right? And this is what's called distortion of the optic signal. You have cut off, if you look at the average power in the negative side, you cut off quite a bit of the energy, for instance. And if you're doing digital processing, this is a big problem because you may not know that this is minus one in your digital logic or something. It's not nice and clean. So this is kind of a problem. So yeah, you have to be very careful. You have to make sure that the switching frequency is compatible with this delay time, storage delay time. Okay. Uh, again, you, have, you can think about this as a capacity effect due to the time it requires for the charges to discharge. Again, remember, you have Lots of charges on this side, this side that has to discharge and get extracted to this side. That takes time. Okay? And that's a capacitance. That's a charge, storage, discharge problem. Okay? It's equivalent to a capacitance if you think about it. Okay? And that's what we'll talk about. Oh, let's see. Okay, let's look at the example problem from the text. So you have P plus N diode is biased in the forward bias direction, forward direction with the current IF. At time t equals zero, the current is switched to minus IF. I, IR, I guess. Use the appropriate boundary condition to solve 547, which is the current as a function of ch charge. For the total charge as a function of time, apply the quasi-static steady state approximation to find the storage delay time TST. 
actually, let's look through the solution, actually. This is, uh, this is a derivation, actually, for the charge delay time. So I'll go through it very quickly. So the equation, essentially, is what we discussed at the very beginning, which is how does current relate to charge instantaneously, okay? So we had the two terms, which is one is the total charge replenishing uh, at a rate of the uh, lifetime of the holes, then the instantaneous change in charge, okay? <clears throat> QP, the total charge, can be related to IF times tau P. Remember, that comes from the steady state. Tau P is the average time for the charges to be replenished. IF is the forward bias current, so IF has to replenish the QP. Okay, so that's basically what we saw before. Using Laplace transform, we can solve this. So you get minus IR over S, QP of S over tau P, S times S, the derivative becomes S times QP over S, and minus IF tau P. These two terms come from the integral, essentially. Okay. Anyway, so, and you can solve for QP of S. You take the inverse Fourier transform, and you get the equation that we saw before, where the charge is proportional to the whole lifetime and, in, and exponentially dependent on the, on the whole lifetime as well. You get two terms there. Now, if you think about this equation, you see what, what's happening, right? If you only had the first term, well, first term is very small, so the, the first term is essentially linearly dependent on the, on the whole lifetime, the second term is exponentially dependent. So you see there are two things happening, one is the recombination, and the second is the extraction. Okay? So remember you're taking the charges and removing them to the other side, and it's the time that it takes, that's what we're trying to calculate. Right? Now, we, in order to relate this to the TSD, the, the lifetime we talked about, because remember, what is the lifetime TSD? We talk, charge storage, storage delay. It is the time it takes for the charges to go to zero. The charge distribution, the excess charge distribution to go to zero. So, so remember this. Okay, let's go back one more. This is what we're trying to calculate. Okay. And if you go back to the charge, okay, one more. Yes. So, no, it's not there. Yeah, it's here. So this is the time it takes for this charge to essentially go to zero everywhere. It's TSD. TSD. So, okay, this, this time right here. Okay. So going back to the <clears throat> next question. Um, so we can calculate from the total charge, we can relate it to the charge, uh, uh, excess charge carry concentration. To the, it's related to the area, the diffusion length, charge. Okay, so you get the next question such as that. And we can set this to zero. This excess charges go to zero. At what time do they go to zero? That is the charge storage delay time. Okay, so pretty simple. Set that equation to zero, solve for T. Okay, you get an expression to this. So under the quasi-static approximation, which is essentially this here, uh, this equation is applicable and this solution is applicable in the quasi-static approximation, we get a very simple expression for the TSD. It's a little bit different than the error inverse error function that I showed before because they're different. One is solved with some uh, numerical, quasi-numerical uh, approximation. Um, methods, I mean, and this is using a very simple quasi-static approximation. Don't worry about the details too much. The important thing here is that the charge, the time it takes for the charges to redistribute themselves depends on the minority carry lifetime. Okay. That's clearly the biggest thing that I want you to extract from here, which is common sense if you think about it, because, because the minority carriers need to be extracted out. Okay, okay so Go back and think about that uh, example um, yourself as well. Okay. Now we have to relate to capacitance, all, all this analysis we've done, because at the end of the day, we want to treat this in, in some sort of equivalent circuit model. Okay. In other words, we need to put something here which describes the capacitance, not just some differential equation. Right? Because if you have millions of these, it'll be very difficult to solve them. We want some equivalent circuit models. And also, it's useful to think about this capacitance for later on, because some kinds of transistors actually depend upon this capacitance for their, for their operation. So what is capacitance? Capacitance is the ability to store, store charge, store and discharge. Okay? 
So I, I placed actually a very simple background video on the parallel plate capacitor, which is basically a review of your electrostatic. So feel free to go online and take a look at it. It talks about essentially what is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, which you should have seen before. Parallel plate capacitor essentially is if you have charges which are separated, okay, positive and negative charges on two parallel plates. If this distance is D, area C, the capacitance is given by epsilon over D. And epsilon is the dielectrical density of the medium which is being absorbed. Capacitance, of course, is also DQ and DV or Q over V or just depending on how you get it. Okay. Okay, it's units of farads. Okay. Coulombs per volt. Okay, for a p-n junction, our goal here, of course, here is to relate capacitance to the physics of what happens in the p-n junction. Okay. Now, it turns out there's a remarkable analogy with the parallel plate capacitor. So, in order for you to remember things, it will be very easy, at least for one of them. There are two types of capacitance for a, for a p-n junction. One is what is dominant under forward bias. Okay. So the question is, if you are on this side of the current voltage curve, and if I change the voltage a little bit, what happens to the charge? Okay? And that's a little bit different than what happens on this side. As you can imagine, the curves are different, right? The capacitance that's important in forward bias is what's called the junction capacitance. This is the intuitive, basically, what we will think of as almost like a parallel plate capacitance. Okay? What's important on the reverse bias is less intuitive, and we'll talk briefly about it, but in, it's less important from a practical perspective as well, okay? So we'll talk about it, but it's less important. Junction capacitance, of course, very important, because it is what will determine the charge store delay and all that stuff, okay? So it's dominant, oh, sorry, the junction capacitance is actually dominant under reverse bias, sorry. Mm -hmm. This is most, more important, as you can imagine, actually. Because under forward bias, the change in charge is very quick. Because remember, it's majority carry injection. So again, going back, so I, I made a mistake here, so let me re repeat this for one second. That under forward bias, if I change the voltage, current changes, right? But that can be fast. Why? Because it is a result of majority carry injection. Right? The holes from the B side going to the N side. And that can be very fast because there's lots and lots of holes on the P side. The, the, the drift uh, field is relatively strong, so it can sweep across, which is pretty fast. Okay, but it still has the uh, capacitor, and that's what's called the charge story capacitor, and we'll talk about that. Whereas on this side, it's more complicated because it has to do with minority carrier extraction. Okay? Or injection, but the same, same principle of so that actually depends quite strongly on the junction capacity. Yeah, you had a question. Um, so if you were in a region sort of in between forward, like large forward um, bias and large uh, reverse bias, then you, I'm assuming that there would be a point where you'd have to worry about equally about both types of capacity. Yes, in, in a general situation, you have to calculate both. And the sum of both will give you the total capacity. But the point is that one of them usually will dominate, and it's the junction capacity typically that dominates. So there are situations where that would that can. So you're talking about a situation where you have high forward bias or high reverse bias. It's very similar to what we just talked about. At the end of the day, it's the charge storage time, the TSD that gives rise to these capacitance. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the junction capacitance. Like I said, the way to think about this is almost like a parallel plate capacitor. So look at the look at the junction. Okay. You have a bunch of uh, uh, acceptors here, which have accepted electrons and negatively charged ions sitting around. They're fixed. Bunch of donors here have given away the electrons sitting around. They're fixed. A bunch of fixed charges sitting around, right? There's dipole. Almost kind of looks like that, right? It turns out you can approximately treat them almost like this, where D is the width of the depletion region. So it's actually pretty simple. But we'll come to that. That's the conclusion at the end of the day, if you think about it. Okay? Okay, so now let's try to calculate this more uh, uh, rigorously. The capacitance, of course, is given by the change in charge as a function of voltage, as I said before. 
Now, uh, there's a, it's a differential change because they're looking at uh, nonlinear curves, right? Because we expect these to be nonlinear, so we need to take differential as opposed to just pure movie. If it's a linear curve, it's just pure For parallel plate capacitors, it's just pure V. Pure spot from the electrostatics. Why, by the way? It has to do with Gauss's law, right? It's all Gauss's law over this for uh, charge density and so on. Anyway, the, the depletion region width under bias, so let's try to solve this equation, okay? First of all, we know that the depletion region width under a bias voltage of V is given by that expression, which I think you used in your midterm, so you should, be, you should remember this. It depends on the, the, the doping on two sides and the difference between the contact potential and the applied bias potential, okay? The charge on each side, of course, is given simply by the area, the char electronic charge, then X and naught. So A times X and naught is the volume here, right? The volume of material here, times the concentration of the donors, the total charges, right? Because we have, remember, we're talking about the depletion region. There are no free carriers. There are only donors and acceptors. Okay, that's the definition of the depletion region. So it's very easy to calculate, right? Volume times the charge times the concentration of donors. And of course, because they should match e e equal to each other, it should be equal to the other side, which is essentially the volume, electronic charge, and the concentration of acceptors. Okay, same thing, we've seen this before. From, and we can plug in from these two equations on what these distances are, how much the depletion region extends into the p-type, how much the depletion region extends into the n-type. Of course, it depends on the doping concentrations, we know that. I know, okay, we can plug those in here. Now we have an expression for Q as a function of the doping concentration and the width of depletion region. Okay. Why, why are we doing this? We, at the end of the day, our goal is to relate total charge Q to voltage V, so we can calculate the capacitance. So now we have a way to do it, right? Now we can plug in this expression, the depletion region width in here, and then you get a very simple expression which looks like this. Okay? So the total charge now is dependent on the applied bias voltage uh, with the square root factor and some other factors. Okay, now you can take a simple derivative. Easy to do. So you get something like that. Okay? So that's your junction capacitor. Okay? So to calculate, it is fairly straightforward. All we did, remember again, we calculated how much charge is on each side. We related the charge to applied voltage. Take the derivative of that. Okay. Now let's see what it means. So the junction capacitance depends on area, of course, that's the same as this. Okay. We expect that. Uh, depends on epsilon and so on, and doping and so on. And interestingly, it depends on voltage, which is not the same as this. Okay? A parallel plate capacitor is not voltage dependent, but the junction capacitance is voltage dependent. Okay? It turns out to be very important for many applications which we'll talk about. So it's a very different kind of a capacitance than you are used to. You're used to a capacitance that's fixed, you know, 100 microfarads or whatever. Here, the capacitance depends on the applied voltage. Okay? And you can clearly think of applications, right? You can tune capacitors. Okay? What is a capacitor used for, by the way? What's an LC circuit? They're not... No, 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 very simply, what's an LC circuit? Yeah, an inductor and capacitor, it's an antenna, right? Like, like uh, well, radio. Yeah, radio is an LC circuit, RLC circuit, but, right? You, you, you tune it, you change the capacitor, you have some, uh, you have different, in the old days you had AM where you had dials which go from different capacitance modes, which go from different bands of the AM and so on. And you're changing the capacitance to change the resonant frequency. So if you think about it, what voltage-dependent capacitance allows me to do is I can use voltage to control capacitance, not physically have to tune anything, which is what, exactly what happens in this. And in this, for instance, for wireless communication and so on. 
okay, you dual band tuning, things like that. Or if you uh, travel uh, overseas, you have you know, three band, basically all voltage control capacity at the end of the day. Okay, so we'll look at that. So it's a voltage dependent capacitance. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. The very specific case, so you have uh, a P plus injunction. So most of the charges are on the, on the P plus side, okay, heavily doped. On the N side, there's a thinner depletion region. Okay. Um, what we can show is that, like I said at the very beginning, the, this whole thing can be equivalent to a parallel plate capacitor whose distance between them is W, the width of the depletion region, as long as you make a small adjustment to the <coughs> this expression epsilon and A. Okay, of course, you could have to introduce some sort of uh, voltage dependence. Okay? And, and let's look at the equations first, and we'll look at the class in a second. So the junction capacitor is basically that. We can relate that to epsilon A over W. Okay, you have a term. Epsilon A is there because this W is voltage dependent. Okay, so it's exactly the same as a parallel plate capacitor where this D, the distance between the parallel plates, is voltage dependent. That's the width of the depletion region. So it's an easy way to remember. Okay, so let me summarize this again. We'll go on to this important point. In a PN junction diode, the reverse bias capacitance or the junction capacitance, okay, is, we'll see why it's reverse bias in a second, is basically epsilon A over W, which is same as a parallel plate capacitor, but now W is the width, the total width of the depletion <coughs> region, which of course is dependent on applied bias. <coughs> <coughs> so it's a voltage dependent capacitance, okay? So, we can think about it here in a P plus N junction. You have lots of charges on the P plus side, depletion region. Okay? And there are charges on the N plus side, which we have ignored for the time being. When you increase the re reverse bias voltage a little bit, so this is reverse bias. Okay? First of all, let, okay, let me step back a second. So this is a P plus N junction under reverse bias. Under reverse bias, what happens? That you're extracting carriers out you're increasing the width of the depletion region, right? You're, you're basically um, isolating more of the ions, right? Acceptor ions or donor ions. In this case, it's cut ions. Uh, sorry, in this case, uh, positive charges, uh, donor ions. So this is the depletion region on the N side. On the P side, P plus side, you've ignored for the time. Being. Okay? So as you increase the voltage, the depletion region increases from W to W plus DW, and the extra charge here, DQ, is QAND DW. Just the volume, QA times DW times the concentration. Okay? So you can very easily see DQ divided by DV should be the capacitance, and if you do the expression, you will get exactly the same as this. Okay? And if you look at depletion width as a function of voltage, you get an expression like that. If you increase, this is under reverse bias. This is increasing. Forward bias, remember, it decreases. As you increase the reverse bias voltage a little bit, the depletion rate increases a little bit. And it's creating more charges. That's the DQ versus DV, the capacitance. Okay. So in this case, when, when, when one side is much more heavily doped, what happens to this equation? This is a general equation. It's basically, you can ignore Na in here in this case, Nd dominates, and you get a very simple expression. <coughs> What's nice about this is the following, okay? C, the capacitance Cj can be measured. Why? Because we can apply voltage, modify, you know, change, the, put a time-dependent voltage, measure how the volt current changes, and from that we can figure out what the charge capacitance is. Okay. Oh, we'll see that later on. The area we know, all these things are constants, applied voltage is known, then we can calculate what the donor concentration is. So this gives you an opportunity in a P plus N junction to actually measure experimentally the concentration of donors 
in the right temperature, which is kind of important when you're doing uh, 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 quality assurance or you're doing characterization of, let's say, memory device. I think they do this here in Utah called IM flash factors. So it's just they measure capacitance and they can measure what the doping concentrations are. Of course, not for everyone, but random points along the way, so for instance. Now, the depletion region, if you plot it against voltage, you get an expression, the, you get, uh, sorry, the depletion capacitance as a function of voltage, uh, it looks like this. As the reverse bias decreases, the capacitance increases, okay, because if you look at this curve, it's slowly saturating, right? The extra extra uh, width that you gain for every marginal voltage is smaller. Okay, why? Because more drop is happening across the junction. If you go back and think about why the depletion is that it's increasing, and under forward bias, this basically uh, almost becomes uh, straight line, okay. and it is more uh, after. Some forward bias voltage, it's more dominated by the uh, depletion capacity. Sorry, the charge storage capacitance will cut back. Okay, so this is the junction capacitance. Okay, the, <clears throat> the next capacitance in the PN junction diode is the charge storage capacitance. It essentially is the same, well, it arises from the issue that we talked about before, but under forward bias. Okay, so this is the small change that we basically ignored when we talked about it. If I told you under forward bias, the change is so fast that we basically ignore it. That's this part. Okay? So the charge storage capacitor arises from the delay between the current and voltage, also called diffusion capacitance, under forward bias. It also happens under reverse bias, but it really doesn't matter, matter because junction capacitance is much more important. Okay? This is essentially the diffusion time. Okay? So it depends on what kind of diode it is. So it's a little bit more involved. It depends on the actual device characteristics. So we'll just approximate it. And, and, and all you need to know is basically there are two different kinds, and it's applicable for two different kinds of diodes that are two different equations. In a long diode, which is uh, most, uh, what does long mean? Long means that the diffusion length is long, and the actual physical dimension of the diode is long. So the carriers last for a long time, essentially, the end of the day. Okay? In a long diode capacitance, the diffusion happens fast, and the carrier lifetime is short. Uh, sorry, in a, the opposite, my, my mistake. In a, in a long diode, essentially, the carrier lifetime is very short, which means that the diffusion and the recombination happens really, really fast. Okay? And this is the case in the case of direct band gap semiconductors like gallium arsenide and so on, which are used in semiconductor lasers. So this is important, for instance, for um, um, optical fiber communication. So if you have a diode laser which is switched out in you know, reverse bias, forward bias, reverse bias, forward bias, the switching speed in the forward bias situation, if you have, if you're, let's say you have a signal which is riding here in the forward bias portion of the direct band gap semiconductor, the switching speed here is determined by what, what's called the the diffusion capacitance, which actually turns out to be quite small in the case of direct band gap semiconductors. So essentially, the, the idea is that the delay between current and voltage under forward bias is very small, like I mentioned before, and the diffusion capacitance is negligible in, in those cases. If the diode is short, which can be sometimes the case compared to the diffusion length in the case of silicon, then you have to take this into account. Then we can est the, the estimation for the diffusion capacitance is essentially shown here. And you can think about this essentially as if you look at this current voltage curve. Okay? If you're operating at some voltage V, and very quickly you switch to another voltage V prime, let's say, how does the current redistribute themselves? What does that mean from a physics point of view? It means that you have injected more. So you increase the voltage a little bit. That means that you increase the current. The current has to increase. And the increase of the current comes from the fact that you're in, you reduce the barrier and you're injecting more majority carriers from one side. So it's fast, like I mentioned, but it might take some time depending on the actual device characteristic. And it actually depends very, very much on how the carriers are injected and extracted. Now, we won't go into the most detail here, but just remember it's something like that. So it depends exponentially on the voltage, similar to the junction capacitance. Okay, to some extent. 
and you have some terms here which depend upon uh, the C being the length of the diode, A is the area, PM is the minority carrier concentration, Q square of the peak width. Um, a diffusion capacity depends upon, uh, like I mentioned, how, how the excess carriers are removed from the device. So in, in numerical modeling is required for accurate values. So, so from, from your perspective, just remember there are two kinds and where they're applicable. Don't worry too much about where they are, how to, the, the mathematics of how to calculate them. So we can also re, uh, define a related parameter as the AC conductance, which is uh, similar to what you would do in small signal analysis for capacitors for AC analysis, which you might have done before. And essentially the conductance, which we will, by the way, we'll come back to when we talk about transistors. Conductance is a very important parameter for transistors. For a diode like this, uh, the conductance is essentially a change in current versus voltage. So conductance is the inverse of resistance, right? dV over dI is resistor resistance, right? So the inverse of that is conductance, di over dv. And you can calculate something like that. Of course, it just comes from this, okay? It comes from this because qp is just a, a lp pn times q divided by tau p. Okay, that comes from the previous expression, the total charge related to the forward bias current. It is under forward bias. So anyway, you can think about it. And when you take the derivative, you get a very simple expression like the Q or K2 times I. So the conductance is linearly proportional to I, the current. Okay? Which is an interesting point by itself, right? It's forward bias. So higher the current, the higher the conductance, so it's a nonlinear phenomenon. So that's where this curve right? is. It's exponential increases. Conductance, in other words, is a slope, right? What this equation tells me, and it's obvious from this curve, is that this slope essentially blows up as current increases as voltage increases. Okay, we'll stop there. So there's a lot of concepts that we discussed, so I want you to go back to think about this. And uh, we will go through the remaining portion of the chapter on Thursday. And I'll post all, this, all the notes for the whole week so you can print them out and bring them with you if you want. Uh, the problem sets are due Thursday. The next problem set will be posted on Thursday. The midterm solutions will be posted today, and you should receive the midterms today or tomorrow. Just check your homework folder. Yes? Um, when, how can we find out like, what the average and what the uh, I can tell you.